All right, uh, let's get started. Actually, no, let's not get started. Just this instant. Let me. Sounds different today. Louder. Sounds more. All right. Are there uh, are there any questions, as usual, about the session last time or anything else we've been discussing? So just a couple of words about the midterm format. That is uh, next Thursday, a week from today. So we have one more lecture on religion on Tuesday and the midterm the following Thursday. Uh, all prior midterms for this class are on uh, my lab website. If you want your teaching and scroll down so you can look at all the, all the previous stuff we've ever asked and give you a sense. The format for this year's exam will be very similar to the last time it was taught. There'll be six short answers. There are one to two paragraph answers. You'll, You'll have one page for each question. If you'd like to question or maybe an image from one of the slides or a news clipping or something, you'll have to read or address. Then they'll have to answer something. It'll require one or two paragraphs of writing. If you've, if you've come to all the lectures, you've taken notes, you've done all the readings, you, you will be fine. Uh, and, um, and then there'll be some choice. You'll answer five or six questions. So you'll have like you know, 10 minutes each. Bang, 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 bang. You just answer them and move on. Alright, um, and any questions about that? And there'll be this TS and organize a review session, and next week we'll also get a break from session, uh, apparently, uh, so no session next week. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Are the TS being nice to you? Nice TS? Yeah. yeah. Say like yes. The TS. <laughs> With one exception, we'll not call any nameless. Right, any, any questions? Okay, last time we discussed the contrast between the desired terminal care in our society and the actual terminal care uh, that's delivered. We saw that Americans pay a lot for care at the end of life, and they have quite reasonable expectations, uh, but they are nevertheless, alas, unable to get what they, uh, that they, they deserve. And in this session, I'm going to be focusing a little bit on the problem of medical harm, or iatrogenesis. How extensive is medical harm? What might be done about it? And how are patients and physicians uh, affected by it? So first of all, what, what did you guys make of, of Illich's uh, strident critique? What do you guys think of Illich? OK, I'm going to do something now. OK, I'm going to turn my back. Raise your hands if you did the read. So, Maggie, about how many hands are up? Oh, I can't count, but a good chunk of the class. All right, so I'm turning around again. Okay, you did the reading, so you have, it's not a trick question. What's your thought about Ida Village? Did you like the reading? Raise your hand if you liked the reading. Wow. Okay, you liked it. Who raised your hand if you found it a disturbing reading? Disturbing, okay. I don't want to pick on any now, but who found it? Why was it disturbing? Any thoughts? You want to offer a thought on why it's disturbing? Oh, come on, guys. Come on. What's wrong? What was, oh, how about this? I'll read, I'll read a passage. And then you tell me what you think about this passage from Ida Village. You ready? Okay, here we go. Here's the first sentence of the book. The medical establishment has become a major threat to health. What do you think of that? The disabling impact of professional control over medicine has reached the proportions of an epidemic. Iatrogenesis, the name for this new epidemic, comes from atros, yatros, the Greek word for physician, and genesis, genesis, meaning origin. Discussion of the disease of medical progress has moved up on the agendas of medical conferences. Let me turn the volume down, it's far too much. That's better. Here we go, a little bit better. Discussion of the disease of medical progress has moved up on the agenda of medical conferences. Researchers concentrate on the sick-making powers of diagnosis and therapy, and reports on paradoxical damage caused by cures for sickness take up increasing space in medical dope sheets. Do you agree with that or not? Well, come on. Why is Illich making this criticism? You want to guess? 
I personally found the reading disturbing since I was doing it at the hospital. But... <laughs> Is your arm broken? Yes! <laughs> okay, so it's a little disturbing. And you know, the doctors wish you broke your wrist, is that right? The ulna or the radius? Um, both. Both broke both of them. Fractured. Fractured, well, yeah, you broke both. Okay. So uh, so yeah, so uh, I was gonna go off on a progression on the proper treatment of fractures, but I'll spare you that at the moment. And I'm sorry your arm's broken. And I'm especially sorry that the readings about how awful medicine is were forced upon you while you were in the hospital. So I'll give you a pass on multiple things. Someone else. What's the village after, guys? Oh, come on, show more bravery. Bravery is a muscle. You need to practice. Raise your hands. It's not a big deal. How about you? Should I pick on you? No? Come on. All right. No, you can do it. There's no judgment. Well, when I was in training, <laughs> one of my residents took me aside. Well, let me just back up. So Illich, Illich is a Marxist, okay? And Illich does not like modernity. And he and, and Emily Martin come from a particular tradition of intellectual critiques. And what Illich is arguing for, not just in this book, but in a number of other books, is the problematic aspects of late-stage capitalism, okay? One of Illich's other books is called De-Schooling Society. Illich is pissed at, medical, at education in our society. He thinks that education is alienating people from their lived human experience, okay? Another book called Tools for Conviviality Illich is pissed at modern uh, transportation systems. He famously arrived, my advisor knew him, I never met Illich, famously arrived at an important international conference. He was a, 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 either a Franciscan or a Dominican monk. He famously arrives on a, on a donkey at this conference to like, communicate his point that he's a poet in his habit on a donkey to this conference to communicate that he rejects uh, modern transportation systems. And in Medical Nemesis, which is a very famous book that had a huge impact in medicine and outside of medicine, he is really pissed at the modern healthcare system. He thinks that what's happening in the system is that people are being alienated from their bodies and their lived experience, okay? His critique is strident, it's powerful, it's vigorous, you have to understand it and engage with it, whether you accept it or reject it, okay? So I'm not taking a stand on whether Illich is right or wrong, although I'm very sympathetic to his position. Uh, <laughs> But I am encouraging you to really deeply understand the criticism, okay? Because that's what we're discussing today. And in fact, when I was in training, one of my residents took me aside and he told me something I have not forgotten. My first week of internship, he said to me, hospital admission is not a benign procedure. Be careful, he said, when you admit people to a hospital. Bad things happen here. It's like the edge of the world on the old maps. There be dragons. Bad things happen to people under medical care, and we need to take this possibility incredibly seriously. Now, there are many different terms used to describe medical harm, which might be like the most overarching term. We might think of errors and mistakes, and an error or a mistake is the failure of a planned action to be completed, or the use of a wrong plan, or there are adverse events. An adverse event is an injury resulting from a medical intervention rather than from the disease itself. And it typically, but not always, involves an error. And an adverse reaction is a bad outcome from a well-planned action. There's no mistake, you did the right thing, but there was an adverse reaction. So not all errors lead to harm. And not all harms are the result of errors. There can also be just malocurrence. Something bad happened, okay? You're sick, you're in the hospital. It just, bad stuff happens. And not all of them are negligence or malpractice, because negligence is judged according to local standards. It is the care, negligence is care falling below the standard of care in the community. So just because in the hands of the world's best surgeon an outcome would not have occurred does not mean a doctor whose care results in a bad outcome has been negligent, okay? Your doctor provides good faith care to you. It's too bad he or she is not the best person in the world to care for this problem, but they nevertheless are practicing medicine consistent with their local community. They are not seen as negligent. And finally, there's also the problem of poor quality care, which subsumes all of the foregoing uh, and more. And Illich and others lump all of these under the term of iatrogenesis, or doctor-caused injury. And this term and medical harm are the most general terms that we might use. 
And here's one way, there are many ways, here's one way to, to group these events. You might imagine that the person has a medical intervention and no, no mistake is made, uh, but they have a bad outcome. That's an adverse reaction. Or no mistake is made and they have a good outcome. That's great. Or there is a mistake, but it's inconsequential, so there's a good outcome. Or there is a mistake and there's a potential adverse event, but maybe the doctor should recover and stop the bad outcome from happening, good outcome. Or there's a bad outcome, and we might think of that as a preventable adverse event. And in medical situations, you can have fulminating combinations of all of these with error upon error, malpractice upon malocurrence, and harm upon harm. And in fact, doctors do countless things that, that, uh, that they think or they may think are helpful, but that actually are not. Exposing patients to risks of harm and expense without any prospect of benefit. And we saw some of this, some examples of this a few lectures ago with respect to the technology that's used during labor, right? When we read Emily Martin, we saw like you know, all this stuff that we might do in labor to treat women delivering babies that maybe aren't helping them and are actually are harming them. And consider this additional example. There's a medical procedure known as percutaneous vertebroplasty, which involves the injection of medical cement into a fractured vertebral body which often presents as pain, back pain, serious back pain uh, in, uh, in, uh, in older people who have osteoporosis. And it, in fact, gained widespread acceptance as an effective method of pain relief and became routine in this country and in other industrialized democracies uh, for the therapy of osteoporotic vertebral fractures. So this bone here uh, breaks, and the procedure is to pass a needle through the back into the bone and inject cement, uh, kind of glue, into the vertebral body. And this state of affairs persisted for quite a while, until 2009, there was a multi-center trial that randomly assigned 131 patients to either undergo the vertebralopathy procedure or a simulated procedure without the cement. So they did sham surgery, okay? This is extremely rarely done. It's quite common that we randomly assign people, you guys get the drug and you guys get a placebo, but it's very rare that any surgical procedure has ever been evaluated by a randomized control trial. Usually surgeons invent a procedure and they start doing it. And they say, oh, it works, they think. And other people start doing it. And before you know it, everyone is doing the procedure and there has never been a trial to test whether the, because it seems so obvious. Of course, there's something here, let's, let's cut it out, right? It seems like logical. And that's why this procedure was adopted. And in fact, uh, it was not helpful. Because the primary outcome in this study were disability and pain intensity and higher scores are, are worse. So this is a measure of disability, and this is a measure of pain intensity, and they look at baseline at three days, at 14 days, at one month in both groups. This is the group that got the uh, intervention, and this is the group that got the sham procedure. We put you, we give you anesthesia, we take you to the operating room, we, pretend, we cut you, your skin, or we you know, puncture your skin with a needle, we pretend to do the surgery, but we actually don't do anything, and then we test and see what happens. Many things have been done for other procedures. Like, joint replacement surgery has now been randomly assigned. It turns out that like, if I pretend to give you a new joint, you feel good again. You know, it, I didn't actually do a damn thing. Some people think that there's actually a physiological reason for this, that cutting the body releases all of these uh, cytokines and other uh, factors that circulate, and that those natural factors are actually what's leading to the healing of the surgery, not the surgery itself, which we think logically is what's doing it. Anyway, they do this, and to make a long story short, they find no effect. And in fact, a similar randomized controlled trial conducted around the same time came to a similar conclusion. And these two trials that were both published in 2009 had a huge effect. Because there was an estimated 81,000 patients that were undergoing vertebral oplasty procedures in the United States between 2006 and 2014, and after 2009, the cases progressively declined for the next five years. And the number of procedures decreased by 53% to just 13,000 in 2008. And the aggregate national cost of the procedures decreased 43%. We're still spending almost $100 million a year on these procedures. So we're still doing a lot and spending a lot of money for a procedure that probably is not indicated. Some people are probably dying because doctors, in good faith, although now the trials have been done, it's hard to know, are trying to help them with these procedures. 
Now, the bad things that can happen to you while you're in the hospital, even with a fractured uh, wrist, like our unfortunate student here <laughs> in the uh, fifth row, I forgot your name? Jordan. Jordan. Um, that can happen to you in the hospital while under medical care run the gamut. This is an example of a very rare but particularly nasty drug reaction called toxic epidermal necrolysis, or SJS, Stevens Johnson syndrome. And in it, your skin literally sloughs off your body. It's like there are snakes shedding your skin. And it's an immune complex mediated reaction. You develop an allergic reaction to something that, uh, that then adversely affects the adhesion of your skin, your epidermal cells to your body, and you slough them off. And it may be caused by many drugs, but also by viral infections and malignancies. And severe SJS is fatal in about 3 to 15% of cases. But whether you would judge this nasty thing uh, to be merely an adverse reaction, or a negligent adverse event would depend in part, for example, on whether the patient survived and on whether the doctor should have known that the patient was allergic to the drug that it was given. So if the doctor gives you the drug that causes this reaction, but there was no way to know you were allergic, we feel differently about that than if you otherwise had the same outcome, but it was known you were allergic to the drug and the doctor shouldn't have given you the drug. And in fact, adverse drug reactions including severe ones like this, are not uncommon. And here's a paper that I was introduced to by an expert in the problem of medical harm, a man by the name of Lucien Lee, the doctor, when I was a medical student in the 1980s. I remember when I read this paper, it was like 1985 or something. I had gone to a lecture, and, and Lucien Lee tells us about this paper, and it made a huge impression on me. Intratracheal fire. Like, there's a fire inside your, your bronchus, like in your lungs, inside your body. There's a fire in the hospital that was caused by the doctors. Intratracheal fire ignited by a, I guess that's a neodymium YAG laser during treatment of tracheal stenosis. So the doctors are in there trying to help you. Your, your trachea is stenotic for some reason, trying to burn it open a little bit. Oops, they get a fire because they're also putting oxygen in your throat to, you know, to, to, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, for you to ventilate, and so you get this, uh, you know, internal combustion. So being in a hospital is indeed not safe if you can actually get fires inside people's bodies, and there are many ways actually to do that, as it turns out. Here's another illustrative case: man has wrong kidney removed. Medical officials said on Thursday that doctors at a Scottish hospital had removed the wrong kidney from a patient during the operation. John Perrin, who media reports said was believed to be in his 60s, had the healthy organ taken out during surgery at Air Hospital. It is with deep regret that I confirm that a patient being cared for in the Air Hospital has had a healthy kidney removed, said Bob Masterton, Executive Director of the NHS Air Share and Iron Trust. Our thoughts are with the patient and family to whom we apologize for this tragic error. Staff are supporting the patient and family and planning for the best possible medical care for Mr. Heron in the future. I mean, they just took out the wrong kidney from this guy. And now, so don't worry, in the future, we'll take good care of you. And in a statement, Heron's family said they were devastated by the disastrous professional errors that should never have happened. And these cases are actually not unheard of. A study of 20 years worth of malpractice claims revealed this, free, this particular frequency of such never events. So what are some surgical never events? There were 10,000 never events in the uh, 20 years, or the 30, 20 years between 1990 and 2010, uh, and surgical retained foreign body, that was most of them, where like the doctor leaves something in your body like a clamp or a big piece, like a, like a tool, like a screwdriver, let's say, being left inside your body. Wrong procedure surgery, that's like, oops, I did the wrong thing, you came in for an appendectomy, instead I like, you know, cut off your knees. Uh, wrong site surgery, like the kidney one we just discussed, or my favorite, wrong patient, you know, <laughs> operated on the completely wrong guy. I'm so sorry, we took out your gallbladder, and we meant to take out your gallbladder uh, instead. And, uh, and the mean payouts are listed here. I, I don't know why the payout for operating on the wrong patient is so much less than doing the wrong procedure. Honestly, I would think the wrong, I would be feeling much more aggrieved if you, if you operated on me in air than if you did the wrong procedure on me in air. Oh, I, I wouldn't like uh, either of them. And wrong person mistakes, though very rare, can take amazing forms. So here is a recent case that was just like uh, a year ago. Woman says she okayed life support termination for a stranger. 
So here's the case. A New York woman sat vigil for days at her dying brother's hospital bedside. And a, a, woman, a, a New York woman who sat vigil for days at her dying brother's hospital bedside authorized doctors to stop life support and was arranging his funeral when officials revealed it had all been a mistake. The man wasn't her brother at all, but a stranger with a similar name. Cheryl Powell is now suing the Bronx Hospital over the case of mistaken identity, saying she and other relatives were put through more than a month of unnecessary grief. That is my baby brother, so it was really hurtful, Powell told the New York Post. I was worried, hurt, crying, screaming, calling everybody. It was a horrible feeling. Her actual brother, Frederick Williams, was alive, but unbeknownst to his family, was locked up in a city jail, another institution which has its own set of problems. St. Barnabas Hospital spokesman Stephen Clark told the Post that the lawsuit was without merit. Like, <laughs> it's like, how, how can it be without merit? Um, uh, where am I? <laughs> uh, the lawsuit had, had, had been, uh, uh, where was it? Um, without merit. The mix-up began on July 15th, according to Powell's lawsuit, when Freddie Clarence Williams was admitted to the hospital unconscious with brain damage following a drug overdose. The hospital looked at its records, saw that a Frederick Williams had been treated before, and called his family, the suit said. But it was the wrong Frank Williams. And remember when we talked about a few a couple of lectures ago when I showed you that thing about patients in the ICU, and I said they could have so many tubes that they released a pamphlet because your relative might have been read, rendered unrecognizable, and you probably thought, oh, that's Nicholas B, you know, his usual dramatic self. Well, no, that's what happened. Your loved one comes in, person is full of tubes, and the, she's the sister of the wrong guy, and she says, oh, maybe this is my brother, okay? And, uh, and uh, Powell said that when she visited the man she thought was her brother, he had a tube in his mouth and a swollen appearance. Another sibling arrived and raised doubts about whether some error had been made. She walked up into the room and said, that's not my brother, Powell said, but the man's facial features were similar enough that the family decided it couldn't be a mistake. One of Frederick Williams' two teenage daughters came from Virginia to say goodbye. She was hysterical, Powell would recall. She was holding his hand, kissing him, crying, and Powell authorized doctors to withdraw life support on July 29th. The city's medical examiner discovered the erroneous identification on August the 16th. I nearly fainted because I killed someone that I didn't even know I gave consent, said Powell. But here is an interesting detail about the British case uh, from another news newspaper. This is Mr. Heron, whose uh, kidney was removed. And if you look at the highlighted text, it said, John said he told doctors minutes before the operation that the pain was on his left side, not the right, but they had already marked his body with a pen and dismissed his fears, even though they had not seen the vital x-rays showing that the tumor was in his left kidney. Now, the majority of these cases are indeed due to a breakdown in communication between the surgical team and the patient and family, according to other studies that have been done of this phenomenon. So it's the, the, the issue I want to highlight now is these, a lot of these dramatic cases of medical error occur because the doctors aren't listening to the patients. The patient says, I'm allergic to this drug. And the doctor says, it's not in your chart. So who should you believe? I can leave the patient. The patient says, it's my left kidney, not, or not my right kidney, but you get a train into this type of procedure, you're on your, you know, you're doing what you're doing, and you sort of ignore the patient. And there are other kinds of things that help explain the, these types of very severe cases. They're, of course, more likely in emergency procedures when unusual equipment is being used, if the staff is rotating, or if there are severe uh, time pressures. But the need for improved communication is stressed to patients. Uh, but, but the need for improved communication is stressed to patients to the extent of even highlighting their responsibility to communicate with their doctors so as to avoid medical mistakes. This is an old tip sheet from a U.S. federal agency on ways to prevent medical errors, and it mentions the problem of wrong part and right part surgery. And it says, for example, ways you can help your family prevent medical errors. Medical errors are mistakes that happen with your health care. Medical errors can hurt or even kill people. The government, hospitals, doctors, and others are working hard to prevent medical errors. This booklet has tips on what you can do to help keep you and your family safe, and these tips are based on studies by medical researchers. And the tips in the pamphlet include things like be an active member of your health care team. 
And this effort to involve patients can actually go quite far. The federal government, through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, has some further suggestions. So here's one of the things that it says. It says, medical errors can occur anywhere in the healthcare system, in hospitals, clinics, surgery centers, doctor's offices, nursing homes, pharmacies, and patients' homes. Errors can involve medicine, surgery, diagnosis equipment, lab reports, and so forth. One in seven med Medicare patients in hospitals experience a medical error. One in seven. But medical errors can occur anywhere in the healthcare system. And you read further down, and it says, what can you do to stay safe? And it says, the best way you can help to prevent errors is to be an active member of your healthcare team. That means taking part in every decision about your healthcare. Research shows that patients who are more involved with their care tend to get better results. Well, they even produced this amusing video called uh, Question, Questions Are the Answer. Uh, which I'd like to play now and see what, what you guys think about it. Let's make sure the volume works here. Here we go. Any questions? No. You know. Will not magicians be kept with each other? Questions, each and every kind. Sense of it. it makes sense, and I get it. 
but at the same time, it's kind of an odd victim blaming kind of shift of responsibility from the doctor to the patient. You're like, oh, I'm sorry, we, we, we operated on the wrong patient, or we took out the wrong body part, and you know, you should have told us or asked us questions. So getting the balance right. Because, uh, and it's also kind of a balance between the institution and the individual, and a kind of balance between patient rights on the one hand and patient responsibilities on the other. Despite everything I told you, though, actually, medical harm can get still worse. Now, probably none of you recognize these four individuals. Uh, on the far, on the far, uh, let's see, on the far left is uh, Charles Cullen a nurse who admitted to killing at least 29 patients in 2006. Next over in the glasses is Dr. Michael Swango, who killed between 35 and 60 patients in numerous hospitals around the United States over a period of time from 1984 to 2000. Next over in the beard is Dr. Harold Shipman, who's probably one of the worst serial killers ever to have occurred in known history. He had over 250 probable victims in England from 1970 to 1998. Uh, he would kill people in the hospital or administer drugs to them in their homes. Elderly people, for example, would steal their jewelry. He had said, oh, I'm coming to pay a home visit, and then he was actually a murderer. Uh, and then on the far right is an active case right now of, of Niels Hovel, who's a German nurse who admitted to killing over 100 patients and maybe 200 at two hospitals between 2000 and 2005, in the period of five years. And what he would do is, is he would give his victims various non-prescribed drugs in an attempt to show off his resuscitation skills to colleagues and in order to fight off boredom. He's bored, and he wants to show off, so he'll give you a drug that'll put you into cardiac arrest and then see if he can save your life. And oops, between 100 and 200 people were killed by this vicious man uh, uh, in the hospital, and his case is ongoing. And in fact, some of the most prolific serial killers that have ever been recorded have been doctors and nurses. And part of the reason is that they have easy access to victims and another really macabre feature, which is they have no problem with disposing of the body. Serial killers, murderers in general, have problem. The body disposal problem is a common problem with killers. You may or may not have paid attention to this feature of criminal activity. But if you're a doctor and you kill a patient in the hospital, there are routine procedures for taking care of the body. They made by St. Lamore, the next of kin are notified, off it goes. So you can be a vicious killer with much greater ease. And in fact, often in these cases, there was complicity of the hospital bureaucracy in such cases. That is, there is, there's a sense in which this phenomenon of serial killer doctors and nurses is an illustration of a broader kind, a social iatrogenesis, to which I will return in a moment. And there's some sense in these cases that the healthcare system can be seen as responsible for them, at least in part. For example, in both the Shipman and the Swango cases, and in many others like it, Subsequent inquiries reveal that the medical establishment, principal, principally through apathy, but often actually protected these murdering doctors, turning a blind eye to their activities. So often, other people would say, you know, it's really weird. Whenever Dr. Swango goes into the patient room, they often die. Dr. Swango's nickname that his colleagues gave him, Double O Swango. They were joking about this fact, but people knew that something was odd about the care this guy was giving. But because of the kind of norms of protection and lack of professional criticism, this state of affairs persisted. Or when an investigation would start to be done, doctor would leave one hospital and go to another hospital. And because of the system in our society about how medical licensure is handled and privacy protections, an existing employer couldn't tell a subsequent employer, you know, this guy's odd. A lot of patients are dying. And so people would hospitalize, just like the Catholic priest sex abuse scandal, when the, they would just relocate the abusive priest and not tell the new parish that actually there was a history of problems. So that on the first occasion of a problem, let's say in the subsequent parish, people say, well, there's a history here, just like in these uh, medical cases. And often this is done in the, in, the, in the name of preserving professional independence from external uh, review. Licensing boards and other authorities have refused to revoke the ability of such doctors to practice, despite compelling early evidence of such doctors acting in a fashion injurious to patients. So there's a whole bunch of ways in which the structure around these doctors is also responsible for what we've observed. 
Now, these are all dramatic examples that I opened this lecture with and that I've given you so far. And of course, most mistakes are much more mundane, involving the administration of the wrong drug or some human or mechanical error that is, to a greater or lesser extent, avoidable or unavoidable. One very comprehensive study in your readings looked closely using systematic assessment tools at the hospital charts of 795 patients in three hospitals. And among these patients, it found that there were 393 adverse events, including eight deaths in the 795 patients. So 1% of the patients died, died, 1% of the patients died in the hospital because of a medical mistake. And some of these patients experienced more than one such event. So here are the types of adverse events, going, you know, medication-related, procedure-related, a nosocomial infection, that's a hospital-acquired infection, uh, some kind of pulmonary problem, device failures, the patient fell, or some other kinds of stuff. Here's the severity level, and I is death, and E is a temporary harm. Here are the eight patients that died out of all of these things. So four of them died due to a, due to a procedure, one due to a nosocomial infection, two from some other cause, uh, and so forth. So that's a very high rate, if you ask me, of bad things happening. Hospital admission is not a benign procedure. In fact, stated in another way, adverse events occur in 33% of hospital admissions at a rate of 91 events per 1,000 hospital days. And as I said, 1% of patients die from them. Incidentally, this study also found that one of the most widely used tools grossly underestimated the frequency of adverse events in hospitalized patients. Overall, mistakes, both minor and major, are not uncommon. And they occur across the whole spectrum of care, from diagnosis to treatment. And the burden of medical harm is significant. Another study, using a very broad sample, found that adverse events occur in at least 3.7% of hospitalizations. 27% of those events are due to negligence, and 13.6% of those events result in death, and 2.6% in serious disability. In fact, our best estimates are that between 44,000 and 100,000 Americans die each year due to medical errors inside and outside of hospitals. Medical harm is one of the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States. It wasn't on the list that we discussed the first two or three lectures, but now we're seeing it. We're seeing that medical harm is a leading killer in our society. And it costs between 17 and 29 billion dollars every year. And this rate of error and of death is significant because there are more than 13 million hospitalizations each year in the elderly alone. And the number of deaths from medical errors would in fact place it in the top 10 leading killers. Even at the low end of 44,000, more people die from medical errors than from motor vehicle accidents, breast cancer, or HIV disease. And in fact, every year, 6,000 Americans die from workplace injuries, but over 7,000 die from medication errors alone. Medical errors in iatrogenesis are not just about serious problems, however. Now, how many of you, so now we put some fat, wrong kidneys, death, and so forth, but it's not just about serious problems. How many of you had your wisdom teeth removed? Raise your hands. All right, well, medical care can come, in fact, in much less severe forms, and it can be very widespread. Five million people per year have wisdom teeth removed at a cost of over $3 billion. 11 million days of productivity are lost. 11,000 patients have permanent nerve damage, but there's no evidence to justify this iatrogenic epidemic. In fact, fewer than 12% of cases are justified. Almost all of you have your wisdom teeth taken out for no good reason. An epidemic of iatrogenic harm and risk and cost that was imposed on all of you. The average oral surgeon in the United States, for about 5,500, makes over half a million dollars a year just from extracting wisdom teeth. You should be deeply suspicious. If you have younger siblings, you should tell your parents they really should not have their wisdom teeth taken out. The practice of prophylactic removal of wisdom teeth just should be stopped, okay? So here's an example of an iatrogenic epidemic that's occurring and affecting people just like you in your age bracket. So the question is, where do these medical errors originate? Do they originate in the structure that surrounds the patient and the doctor, or in the agency of the doctor? And where does medical responsibility for errors lie? With the system or with the doctor? And in fact, there's a tension. There's a tension when we think about this topic. 
between the do no harm as a rule of personal responsibility. So as a doctor, you're trained, this is a Hippocratic oath, it's a fundamental principle. Do no harm. Whatever you do, don't make the situation worse. It's your job not to make it worse. Versus a different way of seeing the problem of medical harm is a kind of structural rather than a genetic feature, which is safety as a system property. Now, since some error is unavoidable, and since error is intrinsic, physicians need to cope with it, both pragmatically, that is to say, if, if it's a human activity, Doctors are going to mistakes are going to be made. We have to figure out how to reduce it pragmatically, but we also have to think about how to cope with it personally. That is, how do you as a doctor deal with a prospect that you might inadvertently harm patients psychologically? Now let's start with a heartbreaking case outside of medicine. Um, an error that warrants responsibility or blame or a change in the system. Baby dies after dad forgot her in the car. There'll be a case like this in the spring. Every year there are cases like this. The baby died after her father forgot to take her to daycare Friday morning, officials told KPRC Local 2. Houston police said the father discovered his mistake when he got to the daycare at Crawford Street near Rosedale Street in Southeast Houston Friday evening. He was there to pick up his seven-month-old daughter and her brother, who was taken to the facility separately. Houston Police Sergeant Robert Blaine said, he forgot about dropping her off and instead went directly to work at Rice University and parked in the parking lot over there. He returned around 5 p.m. to his car, drove back to pick up his son and his daughter at daycare, and upon arrival at daycare, discovered the seven-month-old infant was in the back of his car, dead. The girl was rushed to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. Investigators said they believe she died from the heat. Police said taking the children to daycare separately was a change in routine for the family. The mother dropped off the girl's brother separately because of swim practice. Detectives said they believed this was an accident, and as of Friday night, no charges had been filed, and the investigation continued. There are cases like this every single year in our society. And this was clearly an error. Now, what caused this death, do you think? What caused the death? Some ideas. Uh, Charles. Stephen. Yes. Stephen. <laughs> He was just like, he, was, he just assumed that he had already done the act until he dropped her off. Yes. So is it his fault though? Is the dad responsible for this death? Yeah. Okay. Raise your hands if you think dad is responsible for the death. Raise your hands if you do not think dad is responsible for the death. Boy, you guys are quite good at it. Most of you do. <laughs> Typically it's three fourths that those dad is responsible for the death. What if I told you that the problem here was not the dad, but the drop off system? The procedure whereby we heed this family drop off kids, not the father. Now imagine that you're a surgeon and that you have a change in your routine. And this is one of the prototypic kinds of errors that reason in your reading discusses, for which in principle systems might be put in place to prevent. What kind of system might we want to prevent this example of the death of a kid in a car? Yes? Yeah, there could be a system whereby every, we can say we're going to pass a law. We're going to say in this country, when children are not delivered, the daycare center calls the parents and says, Susie is not here. The dad says, Oh my God, I thought I dropped Susie off. She's in the car. Different system, different outcome. Other ideas. Yes, uh, uh, Stephen. Yeah. You could have someone in the front who's taking like the child out of the car. You know what I mean? So, like, there's like that. Like... Yeah, but he didn't even go. He went straight. He thought. He thought his wife, in this case, he thought his wife had taken both kids. Actually, he had one kid in the back of his car. He never went to the daycare at the beginning of the day. He went straight to work. Then, we, then he drove with the dead child in his car. Drove to the center and the kid wasn't there. But other ideas about systems. Yes, Ben? There could also be maybe like public transportation or something like the bus that comes by and picks people up. Like yeah, we could, okay, we could provide. So we were like, dads aren't doing such a good job. They're forgetting kids and killing them all the time. Let's implement a structural change with buses. Come on, guys. Tech, another techie solution. What could be a tech solution? Yes, what's your name? Rachel. Rachel. Sending a car to... Yeah. Yeah, just like right now, you can't sit in a car without fastening your seatbelt. The alarm goes off, the car won't start, whatever. Maybe we should invent a device. We should pass a law that says, henceforth, all cars will have carbon dioxide detectors such that if their engine is off 
and they detect the exhalation, because the windows are uh, shut of someone's body, the alarm goes off and notifies the owner or something like that. So we could have, if we had such a procedure, we would now say, well, actually, it's the lack of such a system that is to blame, not the individual father uh, in this case. Remember the suicide net that we discussed the very first day, and the cost per life saved, which is about $270,000 per life. This example is isomorphic with the suicide example. Who's responsible? Guy that's fleeing himself off the bridge, or the society as a whole, the structure around the, the individual that constrains his actions or affects them. This is, in fact, the system's perspective on blame and medical error that was in your reading. It acknowledges that the best people can make the worst, uh, the worst errors. Short-lived mental states, such as forgetfulness or inattention, are the last and least manageable part of the error sequence. People will always make errors and commit violations. And blaming people for their errors will have no effect on their future fallibility. Okay? This is the claim in the system's perspective that's a crucial idea uh, in your readings, like the driver uh, and this baby. So let's talk a little bit about this problem of blame. Because a very influential report was released by the Institute of Medicine in the year 2000, and it was trenchantly trench entitled To Err is Human. And it identified several ways of reducing medical harm. And one of them was this. Healthcare organizations should implement non-punitive systems for reporting and analyzing errors. The idea is, is if we blame the father, or we blame the surgeon for making a mistake, we reduce our ability to detect the kinds of system problems that are putting human beings in this situation. So in fact, we do not want to blame the father. We do not want to blame the surgeon. We do not want to blame the airline pilot for the crash. Instead, we want to have everyone report transparently what mistakes are happening without blame so that we can improve the system because all systems are operated by human beings. And the Institute of Medicine and other official policy-making bodies and experts in medical error have championed the need for a blame-free culture in medicine, with systems for detecting and reporting errors similar to other industries. It is commonly argued that the best way to uncover and reduce error is to promote a culture where no blame is ascribed to individual actors. Moreover, in this paradigm, most errors are viewed largely, largely as system-based as impossible to eradicate completely and is infrequently traceable to truly negligent actions. We're supposed to shift, and I agree, to a large but not complete extent, we're supposed to shift our perspective to a system perspective that says human beings are going to be fallible, there are always going to be some mistakes, what we should be focusing on is how to revise the structure. And blame is seen as doing more harm than good, as engendering feelings of inadequacy or fear of punishment and is ultimately pushing analysis and recognition of the state's underground and limiting opportunities for improvement. So current thinking about the occurrence and prevention of errors focuses on a systems perspective. And I'm not sure I entirely agree, but let me tell you what the idea is. The idea is that healthcare is a complex system. Errors and harms result from multiple faults and diffuse breakdowns. And humans are just one part of the system and that, in fact, error is an intrinsic part of it as well. And this is, in fact, uh, the Swiss cheese model that was in your reading. When large systems fail, it's typically due to multiple fa faults that occur together. Every step in the process has some potential for failure. And the ideal system is, a, is, a, is analogous to a stack of slices of Swiss cheese where the holes are not aligned. Okay? So at each level, the nurse, the doctor, the pharmacist, the equipment, the hospital room design, all of these things are optimized to minimize the error, to stop. The error is going to start, and but it gets stopped at some uh, particular uh, level. And in fact, for a catastrophic error to occur, the holes would need to align. And only if and only if everything breaks down do we then get to a situation where the patients are harmed. And in fact, the more defenses that you put up, the better. And the fewer holes and the smaller the holes, the more likely you are to catch and stop errors that might occur. And in fact, one of the greatest contributors to accidents in any industry, including healthcare, is human error. But saying that an accident is due to human error is not the same as assigning blame, because most human errors are induced by systems failures, this perspective claims. 
Humans commit errors for a variety of known and complicated reasons. And these errors, according to your reading, according to the reason reading, can be called latent errors or systems failures. And they are felt to pose the greatest threat to safety in a complex system because these latent errors lead to operator errors. They are failures built into the system and present long before what's called the active error. So the whole way everything was designed is such that when you put some humans into the system unavoidably and occasionally and through no fault of their own, they will make a deadly mistake. These latent errors are difficult for people working in the system to see since they may be hidden in computers or layers of management and the people may become accustomed to working around the problem. And a typical example of a latent error is the packaging of two different medications in the same kind of ampule. Who can blame a doctor or nurse who accidentally administers the wrong medicine in such a circumstance? The current responses to errors tend to focus on active errors. And in many cases, it's not an effective way to make systems safer. But discovering and fixing latent errors is likely to have a greater effect on building safer systems than efforts to minimize like, the tip of the iceberg, like right? trying to stop the doctor at the last step. That's not actually the best way to fix the problem. The application of human factors analysis in other industries, like the airline industry and the nuclear power industry, has successfully reduced errors. So healthcare has to look at medical errors not as a special case of medicine, but as a special case of error, and apply the theory and approaches already used in other fields to reduce errors and improve reliability. Hence, the systems perspective believes that medical accidents are usually the result of complex systems failures. And although incompetent and malfeasant like serial killer staff exist, adverse outcomes are more commonly the result of such, of such systems problems. Now, there are two typical types of human fallibility something known as a post-completion error, and something known as a miscompletion error. Now, a post-completion error is omitting a final step of a process. For example, how many of you have sent an email without the attachment? So you're going through your thing, you're writing the email, and you're so excited, you get to the end, you hit send, but oops, you made a mistake. You didn't attach the document. Or you left your original documents on a Xerox machine. You go to a copier, you're copying the documents, you leave with your copies, but you leave the originals. That's a post-completion error. And a miscompletion error is an example of something that happens in the course of the action. For example, you might start a drive and then take a left turn instead of a right turn and wind up going to school instead of work. Because you know you routinely have two different ways of driving, you're an automatic pilot, and now, oops, you make a mistake. Maybe you heard a great song on Spotify, for example. Or you find yourself at the location of your math instead of your physics class that day because you happen to bump into one of your math classmates while walking absent-mindedly. How many of you have walked to the campus and you find yourself, oh god, I'm in the wrong place. You got confused. You, know, you ran into Susie, who you usually see on Wednesday, but today is Tuesday. You walk with Susie along the two clocks. Oh, whenever I see Susie, we always walk to this location. And you wind up in the location and Susie says thanks and leaves you. And you're like, what the hell am I doing here? No, I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's human, but when you're a surgeon, it causes other problems. Here's an example that happened to me uh, in Ezra Stiles. So I was with Stiles, and the usual procedure when you have tater tots is what? You, you take a plate off the top, you have a tray, and you put the plate on the tray, and then you use the scooper, and you scoop some tater tots, and you put them on your tray. I'm sorry, on your plate, right? That's what you're supposed to do, but this is what I did on that day. I forgot the step in the middle of putting the plates, right? So here's the tray, here are the plates, here's the scooper. I'm so excited about eating the tater tots that I just put the thing and I put the things right and I skip the middle step that involves uh, the plate. Has this ever happened to you guys? No, I'm just my middle age, I guess. <laughs> now, what would be a system solution to this problem? What would be a system solution to this problem? Yes, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew, yeah. Andrew. What? <laughs> I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Get rid of the trays. Get rid of the trays. Get rid of the trays. Yes, very good. If I got rid of the trays, although I might be so dense, I might scoop right on the counter. Okay? <laughs> what's another? Uh, so very good. That is, in fact, a solution. Other solutions. Get rid of the plate. Yes, what's your name? Uh, Taylor. Taylor. <laughs> yes, thank you. 
there could be a human there that puts the plates on the trays, or maybe glues the, the plates that would be pre-attached to the trays to prevent idiots like me from putting their tater tots on their trays that arrive. Now, we're laughing at the tater tot example, but in medicine, these would be good ideas, right? If you're doing the wrong thing, you might want to address the problem uh, in this way. Um, and this, there's this movement regarding medical error. This movement regarding medical error has all also pushed for changes in vocabulary and in thinking. So we're not supposed to speak anymore about human error or root cause or investigation or judgment or blame or isolated event or punitive or retaliatory. This is kind of like the George Carlin. You guys don't know George Carlin, but he's hilarious. The kind of George Carlin kind of re-narrated words. No, it's not human error. It's, the George Carlin routine is that the contrast between football and baseball, have you guys ever seen that routine? So good. It's so good. You know, in, in, in football, you know, you penetrate the end zone. In baseball, you go home. You know, in football, you pay a penalty. In baseball, you make an error. You know, so this is Carlin's sort of contrasting. So this is the George Carlin idea about vocabulary change. It's not a human error. It's accident for failure. It's not a root cause. It's multi-causal. It's not an investigation. It's just an analysis. It's not a judgment. We're just learning here. It's not blame. You know, it's accountability and so forth. It's not punitive. You know, it's kind of blameless. And these vocabulary changes are meant to suggest a new perspective and hence ways of fixing the system. And incidentally, this is another example of the social construction we discussed earlier in the term. But here, we are constructing our perspective on medical mishaps. And this systems perspective has proposed various fail-safe devices and technical fixes, similar to the changes implemented in, avia implemented in aviation safety, such as checklists and foolproof equipment design. And here are some suggested changes to parts of the system having to do with the administration of medications. How are we going to stop doctors from goofing when it comes to medication? We'll put in pharmacy computer systems, automated dispensing cabinets, barcoded drug selection, barcoded patient identification, computer generated or electronic medication administration records, electronic drug information, and checklists. When I was a resident in the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, they just put into the system this computerized method when you would order a drug for a patient, the computer would tell you, wait a minute, this drug has a conflict with another drug the patient is on. What a great innovation. I'm not my fault that I gave the wrong prescription in this type of a situation. For example, there are many reasons for unclear medication orders that technological interventions, modifying the structure and circumventing the physician's agency, might fix. One study found that 17% of physicians had illegible handwriting, for example. And for example, dispensing errors can be made because medication names are misinterpreted and not just illegible. There are hundreds of drugs with similar names that have been confused and interchanged. So quinine is not quinidine, sulfasalazine is not sulfadiazine, hydroxazine is not hydralazine, I know all of these drugs. Losec is not Lasix, clonidine is not clonidine, uh, you know, lamitrogine is not lamid lamididine, and so forth, and venblastine is not vancristine, and, uh, and so forth. And in fact, some brand name drugs cause such confusion and frequent medication errors that the manufacturers voluntarily change the brand names. For example, Losec, which is listed here, is actually Omeprazole. And it was so often mistaken for Lasix, in fact, maybe they were losing money because the wrong drug was being given, that they changed the name to Prilosec, which you guys can find. Whose fault is it when doctors and nurses use the wrong drug, even if the names are very different, if the vials of the drug are hard to distinguish, and both types of vials are in the same drawer at the patient's bedside. These are two drugs that might be in an ICU patient's bedside. Ferrosamide on the left, which is a diuretic, and midazolam on the right, which is an, uh, puts you to sleep as an anxiolytic, it's a valiant type drug. They're in the same vials. If you reach into the vial and you try to um, prescribe this medication, you might uh, you know, make a mistake. It's, it's, you know, it's quite innocent. And this problem, in fact, can affect us all. So, you know, I had this problem recently. I was trying to buy some shampoo, but I wound up buying conditioner, okay? I mean, this does not strike me as the right kind of packaging. It does not strike me as the right kind of, uh, it does not strike me as the right kind of packaging uh, in this type of a situation. And this sort of thing can indeed happen to anyone and not just doctors. So my brother was visiting and uh, left his toiletries in the bathroom 
and I wanted to borrow his shaving cream. Okay? So I was trying to take a shave, and I reached for the can of the toiletries that my brother had dropped and left there. Uh, and at least I thought it was a shaving cream. Uh, what I really wanted was the thing on the right. And if you look at these two products, they're actually very different products. But they look very similar, but they have completely different uses. One, one provides for ultimate closeness and ultimate comfort, and the other fights odor and relieves itching, burning, cracking, and scaling. Okay? Two very, two very similarly packaged products, and I innocently reached for the wrong one because of a change in routine. My brother was visiting, and apparently he has bad uh, athletes look. I'm um, Okay. So in fact, there is no doubt that such changes in systems improvements are effective. And here are some results from one now old study involving computerized order entry uh, with doctors. Uh, so what, how much can we improve if we, if we computerize uh, this, this process? We can reduce serious medication errors by 55%, and prescribing errors, and transcription errors, and dispensing errors, and administration errors, and we can reduce preventable adverse drug events. And non-interceptive potential adverse drug events can also be reduced. So all of these things can be made better if we just fix the structure, if we just fix the system uh, around the patient. And indeed, hospitals can do better when they are forced to do better. To ensure compliance with high standards of care for patient safety, the Joint Commission for the Accreditation of Hospitals performs unannounced on-site inspections at U.S. hospitals every 18 to 36 months. So every 18 to 36 months, in an unannounced way, accreditors arrive at the hospital. And they have a week-long inspection procedure where surveyors closely observe a broad range of hospital operations, focusing on high-priority patient safety areas like infection control and medication management. And the stakes for performance during such a survey are very high, because if the hospital screw up, they'll lose their accreditation or they'll get a citation in the review process that can adversely affect their uh, reputation. So hospital staff are aware that they're being audited and they're very careful. Their behavior is extremely uh, improved. This study sample included 24,000, I'm sorry, 244,000 uh, 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 admissions uh, during the survey period and 146,000 admissions during the non-survey weeks with similar patient characteristics, reason for admission, and in-hospital procedures. And here's what they found. This shows the 30-day mortality of patients in the hospitals before and after and during when the surveyors are there. And oh my goodness, mortality drops by a significant amount when doctors and nurses are paying attention and up their game. Fewer patients die. Why can't they do this all the time? Why must they we wait for the inspectors to be there before uh, the mortality decline. And in fact, 30-day mortality for admission during the survey period was 7.03%, and non-survey weeks, 7.21%. Thousands of patients' lives, lives could be saved every year if we practice in this superior way. And there are other structural threats to patient safety, too, such as the unavoidable annual rotation of house staff. Uh, every year, um, in July, all the doctors move up a year, okay? So everyone suddenly is the most junior they can be for the level of career they're at. The interns just came from medical school. The first year residents just finished from being interns. The second year residents just finished from being first year residents. And what we find is in July, there's a blip in mortality. Patients are more likely to die if they're admitted in July than if they're admitted at any other time of year. And this slide shows some results from that. This shows the month of the year, from January to December, and two different outcomes, the average length of stay in dotted lines and the average mortality in the solid line. So first of all, why is this curve parabolic in general? Yeah? Because there are some seasonal changes and it's like going back to the same month. Yeah. Very good. So patients are less likely to die in the summer than they are in the winter. Different kinds of diseases in the winter time, different conditions, different accidents, different whatever the hell is happening. It's all different in the winter than the summer. So there's a general kind of seasonal variation. But the point is, is that if you were mapping out the parabola, it would follow this little red line here, but it doesn't. It flattens out. 
there's a like upward blip in mortality. See, there's a blip here that should be going like this. There's a little blip up, which can be quantified in this paper, that shows that actually there's a, like excess mortality that occurs during July that would have been expected during to the during the uh, trends in general. Perhaps as many as one out of a thousand hospital patients in July die merely because of the newness of the interns alone. And to put that figure in perspective, that's roughly your risk of death in the next year. You young people in your 20s have a risk of death of about one in a thousand in, uh, in any given year. Um, now medical errors, and in particular medication errors, seem to be a especially prominent part of the July phenomenon. Inside medical institutions, or uh, met fatal medication errors spike in July, but not in any other month. This July spike appeared only in counties containing teaching hospitals, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and in fact, in these counties, July mortality for medical medication errors was 10% above the expected level. So this shows the month of death of patients, and this is the ratio of observed to expected deaths for inpatient medication errors by month. And you see, oh, these are these expected rate of death, and oh my goodness, in July you get a big spike. The doctors are making mistakes left and right in the kind of drugs that they prescribe. And here's still another study showing the July phenomenon. Again, these results indicate that high-risk acute myocardial infarction patients experience similar mortality in teaching and non-teaching hospitals in July, but lower mortality in teaching intensive hospitals in May using data from 100 teaching intensive and 1,300 non-teaching intensive hospitals during May and July of 2002 to 2008. And so what it shows is, it shows inpatient mortality. Let's just look at the high predicted mortality. See, these are patients with serious diseases. And let's look at what happens when we compare July to May uh, in high mortality in teaching hospitals. So in non-teaching hospitals where there are no interns, it doesn't make a difference whether it's July or May. But in teaching hospitals, ordinarily mortality is lower, but bang, spikes during uh, July. More evidence for the July effect. Now finally, there's another way that I'd like to close with today in just a couple of slides, that medical care can be harmful um, beyond the one-on-one -on -one effects on the bodies of individual patients that we've been considering. So we can begin to think now about two different kinds of iatrogenesis. Iatrogenesis that causes individual harm, and iatrogenesis that causes collective harm. Because medical care can also impose the latter. And this is one conceptualization of what is meant by social iatrogenesis, which is a very important idea in this book, which you need to read. It's a, you're not reading the whole book, you're just reading 60 pages. And a straightforward example of this is the creation of drug-resistant pathogens that can spread in human populations. So doctors caring for individual patients, but doing it recklessly, contribute to the creation of drug-resistant germs that harm other people. So I'm caring for you, I'm doing it badly, it might or might not affect you, my bad care, but in my, my poor prescribing of antibiotics contributes to the emergence of drug-resistant pathogens, which then kill you and you because of the bad care that I've given this guy. And keep in mind that the history of penicillin antibiotics uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and a particular pathogen called Staph aureus uh, was in fact triumphant. Uh, but the careless prescribing of antibiotics has contributed to the emergence of resistant pathogens in many kinds of categories. Uh, Multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, HIV, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, which is this uh, problem, uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, and so forth. So this shows the total number of discharges from 1993 to 2005 of people who were discharged with a, with a serious infection of a, with a germ that had been rendered immune or resistant to this very powerful drug that we had called uh, methicillin. And I should note that these numbers have come down a little bit since then, but the primary point still holds. In fact, the CDC estimates that as many as 2 million nosocomial infections from all pathogens are acquired in hospitals each year, resulting in 90,000 deaths. So nosocomial infection alone would be one of the top 10 causes of death. And amazingly enough, Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, anticipated this. 
So he chances on the discovery of penicillin. He wins the Nobel Prize in 1945. This is something this man said during his Nobel lecture. The time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there is the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. Here's a hypothetical illustration. Mr. X has a sore throat. He buys some penicillin and gives himself not enough to kill the streptococci, streptococci, but enough to educate them to resist penicillin. He then infects his wife. As the streptococci are now resistant to penicillin, the treatment in her fails. Mrs. X dies. Who is primarily responsible for Mrs. X's death? It's actually mind-boggling to me what Fleming wrote. I mean, so prescient in so many ways, and so informed, I would argue, even by the sociological principles that we've been discussing today, not just the micro microbial and pharmacological principles that he was a forerunner of. But Illich is making a much broader and more subtle argument than the multi-drug resistant examples I've given. He means something different and broader by social iatrogenesis and his critique of medicine is strident and compelling. Social iatrogenesis is the over-medicalization of the human experience. It's the expropriation of health. It occurs when people are encouraged to use doctors for more and more trivial problems, as we saw with the, with the health transition and some of the other ideas that I've been introducing you to. And it captures the tendency of medicine to damage health not via individual bodies, but by affecting the total social milieu. And here's what Illich writes on page 41 of the version of the book that I have. Social iatrogenesis designates a category of ideology that encompasses many forms. It obtains when medical bureaucracy creates ill health by increasing stress. Think, of, for instance, about our insurance systems and how much stress they impose on our citizens. It occurs by multiplying disabling dependence, by generating new painful needs. You know, we create conditions that we say that you must get medication for, and by lowering the levels of tolerance for discomfort or pain, by reducing the leeway that people are wont to concede to an individual when he suffers, and by abolishing even the right to self-care. Social iatrogenesis is at work when healthcare is turned when healthcare is turned into a standardized item, a staple when all suffering is hospitalized and homes become inhospitable to birth, sickness, and death, when the language in which people could experience their bodies is turned into bureaucratic gobbledygook, or when suffering, mourning, and healing outside the patient role are labeled a form of deviance. This is a very powerful critique of how we think about the role of medicine in our society. And Illich then goes on to describe cultural iatrogenesis, which destroys the human ability to deal with human weaknesses. People, he argues, become distanced from their lives, from their own humanity, and medical interventions interfere, he argues, with our authentic experience of our bodies, of suffering, of birth, and with death. Illich is concerned with the adverse impacts of the social construction of disease. He is concerned with the ways in which the definition of a condition as a disease can cause harm. What does it mean, he asks, when a doctor detects a disease that the patient does not? What does it mean when the patient detects a disease that the doctor does not? And what are the consequences for individuals and for society of labeling patients with a diagnosis? In writing in 1976, he anticipated and was very critical of the system's perspective of medical error. So image and reason are intention, guys. They disagree about what the problem is. And here's what Illich says about the system's perspective. He says, with the transformation of the doctor from an artisan exercising a skill on a personally known individuals into a technician applying scientific rules to classes of patients, malpractice acquired an anonymous, almost respectable status. What had formerly been considered an abuse of confidence and a moral fault can now be rationalized into the occasional breakdown of equipment and operators. In a complex technological hospital, negligence becomes random human error or system breakdown. Callousness becomes scientific detachment. 
and in competence becomes a lack of specialized equipment. The depersonalization of diagnosis and therapy has changed malpractice from an ethical into a technical problem. So again, guys, just like we discussed Emily Martin and the social construction perspective and the real perspective, these are not easy topics. It's not easy to square Illich's argument, which is strikingly critical of the system's perspective and wants the doctors to take responsibility for the harm they cause and to be blameworthy with the reason argument about the system's perspective and how that reduces error and is more forgiving of individuals and focuses on the structure around the doctor and says, look, it's not the doctor's fault if the drugs are similar and the equipment is different and the routines change. And it seems as if there's, in fact, plenty of blame to, and responsibility to go around at all levels. But doctors actually might be willing to take this blame because they also want the credit for the benefits that medicine offers. Okay, that's it for today. See you next time.